Hello, everyone. Welcome back to FFG Live. My name is Evan Johnson, and I'm here with John Schaefer, painter Hello. extraordinaire. Uh, and today we're going to do some advanced painting tips. So John has a couple of topics that he's going to cover um, that, that, I mean, there's probably something to learn, I'd imagine, no matter what your painting level is. Oh, uh, for sure, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but these ones are more specifically designed for, for like advanced painters, and we have previous videos for like beginning painters mm -hmm. and intermediate painters. So like, no matter what your painting level is, you'll probably get something out of this, but you can also go back and watch some of those previous videos if you want to learn some more about painting. So we're going to uh, get into it. If you guys have questions about what John's talking about or painting in general or any kind of that, just throw them in the chat on Twitch or YouTube and uh, we'll see them and ask them out. So let's, uh, let's get into it. All right, cool. What, what have we got here on the table? So uh, there, there's a lot of different um, painting styles. I think when it comes to um, painting miniatures, you can um, paint them for tabletop, you can paint them for display, mm -hmm. you can paint them with a lot of um, object source lighting, which means that like um, lightsabers are glowing and it has reflected light. You can paint it with a zenithal painting uh, technique, which means that like light is at its zenith, at the very top up above it, and it kind of shines down on it. So um, you actually paint in a lot of the shadows as opposed to just letting the natural light um, affect it and define some of the, uh, the forms of the miniature. Mm -hmm. So um, what I'm going to do in this one is, uh, uh, the first part is going to be uh, about zenithal painting in general, which is kind of like describing it um, as I did before where you've got uh, the kind of the shadows that you're gonna go through and you're actually gonna paint in on the miniature. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some batch painting in general and just like some, uh, some ways that I go about painting miniatures in pieces and also in groups to try to get stuff done faster and more efficiently um, with a little bit less fuss. And the last bit is gonna be about lightsabers. So uh, just how to paint uh, some of that glowing effect using some transparency, uh, some existing paint and some uh, matte medium, which is a, a material that some painters might be familiar with, some might not. So we're going to kind of go over all those different things. So uh, like Evan said, if you do have some general questions in the chat, uh, just go feel free to post those up there. I'll try to answer them as we get, go through them all. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to start off with this clone trooper guy right here. So we've got this kind of yeah. like new little rig that we've set up a little bit, just so you can hopefully get a little bit better uh, view on the miniatures uh, that we have in place. So you can see here that this guy has got, um, I primed him gray first, and then I went over top of that with an airbrush uh, from higher up. You could also use a spray can if you wanted to, but I find that uh, using a, a rattle can like spray primer sometimes will get you very uh, large droplets of the, the primer itself, and it sure. kind of gives you a very modeled effect. Mm. So if you have access to an airbrush, um, there's lots of tutorials online that can get you started uh, and get uh, set up for that. And again, this is kind of an advanced uh, technique in particular. It's something that a lot of painters use anymore just to give them like a really good guide coat at the very beginning that helps kind of define some of the shadows and, and highlights, and it's really great for kind of display quality miniatures if you're going through and doing that. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, this guy, if you can see in the camera there. Uh, down in these lower recesses, you've got kind of like a darker gray, but as you get up towards the top, you can see that uh, it is pretty much just straight white. And that was just, again, accomplished by, I did them separate from the base, um, primed with the darker color first, mostly because the base tends to kind of get in the way a little bit um, when you're spraying from below or doing some, you could do this in like three layers if you wanted to, mm -hmm. just like a medium gray, a darker, if you really wanted something really dark along the bottom, but also, um, which is something that I'll, I'll tie into here a little bit later, I like to paint bases separate from miniatures a lot of times because mm -hmm. I find that um, the messy techniques used in painting bases sometimes will translate into stray brush strokes going on the legs and the feet of your miniatures. So, so that's why you have the base done, but the miniature. Yeah, I've already so finished that base yeah. first, I, I, and I'm probably not in the majority in that technique. It's just something mm -hmm. that I per personally like to do. Yeah. So I guess it's another thing to just reiterate. There's a lot of different ways you can always go about this uh, this craft and kind of whatever's most comfortable for you. Mm -hmm. All you mm -hmm. can really do is just kind of look and see how other people do it. Just glean what you can from that uh, mm -hmm. process and and shape it in your own way to figure out a, a great way that you can go forward with it. Totally. Before we get into kind of like a technique of like how you do this, uh, yeah. maybe like what are the advantages of this kind of, of painting in this kind of way with Zenithal? Uh, it can produce a really dramatic uh, level of contrast, mm -hmm. I think, which is which is one of the nicest things about it. It can uh, really make the miniature look like it is in a set a setting in particular. So sure. it's, it's great if you're uh, doing like dioramas or anything mm -hmm. in particular where you have like a distinct light source. 
sure. which you are actually painting in where the light is hitting things as opposed to just having this really flat light across everything. Because you're playing, you know, you're playing, you know, in a game store, it might have like fluorescent lights or something. It's just kind of like the shadows are as the shadows are. Yeah. But, but if you paint them in this way, it can really kind of capture like that hot tattooing sun, maybe like beating down. Sure. Yeah. Guys. You can do things like that or um, like other atmospheric lights or lanterns and things like yeah. if you have a setting that the miniatures are set on, it, mm. it gets even that much more dramatic because you can really integrate them with their setting. For sure. Um, so yeah, if you're doing like some sort of diorama type painting, that sort of thing, then uh, yeah, it's certainly a good way to go about it. Um, so I've kind of like, uh, I've chosen white because it's one of the more pronounced colors. And I think the other little bit that I've done here, which you might be able to, the camera might be able to pick it up, is that I have taken a hobby knife and I've gone through and I've kind of nicked a couple little scores here because the plastic is already inherently a darker gray. And what I've done is um, I've just kind of like added in a few couple little chips here and there just because I want to do some battle damage on this guy too. Just, so just as an indicator where some of those things might lie. That is totally an optional step. You don't necessarily have to uh, do that yourself. But just to explain some of these like darker areas here on the race parts uh, and what my thought was behind that. Cool. So uh, you have a lot of different grays that you can utilize. Um, we're using uh, the new Legion paints. Um, so I'm going to use some kind of like of the warmer colors in particular. So I've got uh, Stormtrooper armor, which is obviously very appropriate here for what we're doing. Uh, I've got Death Star Gray, which I can kind of show these up here on the camera. You can see that Death Star Gray. That's kind of our medium tone. And then for our, our darkest areas, I'm going to use Sullust Stone, which is a little bit of a, a deeper, uh, darker gray color. So you always want to make sure to shake these up really well. And then uh, sometimes we'll have a little bit of medium at the very top of it, which is mm. medium is essentially just paint without the pigment in it. Uh, it's kind of like the, the binder that's in the, in the middle of, uh, of, of paint that gives it its, uh, its flow properties. Right. Um, and sometimes you just want to kind of bleed some of that off of the top. When you're, uh, but you definitely want to shake them up pretty well. And then I'm using a, a palette here which you can see, and I'm just gonna add a little bit of this mm -hmm. um, to the actual palette itself. Um, this is a wet palette, if you're not familiar with it, it essentially has a sponge underneath, piece of parchment paper here on top of it, and then it soaks up water from underneath it, keeps your paints a little bit wetter for longer. So it's, a, it's handy, especially if you're going back and using mixes of colors, which we are going to do in this case. So I'm gonna have a little bit of this, uh, gonna be kind of my middle gray. As you're getting into this, I see a question here from uh, Sean Gallagher. What's the best way to avoid graininess? Whoa. How <laughs> to avoid graininess in white? Graininess in white. Okay, uh, it's a lot of really thin uh, layers. So um, mm -hmm. white has a lot of pigment in it. It's like really packed full of a lot of pigment. And sometimes that pigment will bind itself to itself and create little lumps and things in the actual paint that you right. have. So I think that what you really want to do is uh, start off, I like to mix in a little bit of flow medium with with the paints in general. Sure. You can get like matte medium and stuff from an art supply store. There's lots um, that are made by miniatures manufacturers mm -hmm. um, in general. So yeah, you can find a lot of different options available to you. Um, and I like to mix a little bit of that in with, with the paint, um, which will kind of thin it out a little bit, but not make it so watery that it's just going to pool down in the recesses. And mm -hmm. you just have to, you have to be really patient with it. You have to like just build up successive coats. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend that if you're painting white or something that is largely white, that you actually prime it white. Mm. Because if you're starting out with a darker colored primer, uh, you know, this is kind of an exception. This is a very light gray that I primed this with. Um, it's just going to be that many more layers you got to build up to get to a pristine white. And it's just going to be that many more opportunities to get like, chalkiness introduced to the whole thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I think you want to cut it down with a little bit of medium, a lot of successive thin layers, and just be patient with it. White is one of the more challenging colors to paint, for sure. It can be tricky. All right, cool. So um, I've, I've got these these three colors here that are kind of set up here. I don't know if you can see on the palette or not. Uh, this uh, Solace Stone in here, this was uh, still Death Star Gray, and then uh, Stormtrooper Armor. So in addition to that, I'm going to throw a little bit, kind of as I mentioned before, a little bit of medium here on my palette, which is probably not going to show up very well. It's essentially just kind of a clear liquid. Uh, it looks white when it's, uh, when it's still wet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this guy right here. But this is essentially, like I mentioned before, it's, it's paint without, uh, without the pigment in it. And it, what this does is it allows me to increase the transparency of the paint without <laughs> actually um, thinning it down so much that it just you lose control of the flow of it. Mm -hmm. So I like to mix some of this stuff in, in general, with my paints. And because we're going to start off with this kind of medium gray, I'm going to mix some of this in here as well and just kind of get a little bit of my palette here. Mm -hmm. So now what I want to do is I want to kind of go down into like the underside of each of these areas here and start to paint some of that, that shadow in just to kind of like really solidify that this is a little bit darker down in these like undersides of all these. 
That medium is also going to extend the, uh, um, the drying time a little bit too, so it'll make it so it's a little bit easier to go back in and actually add in uh, lighter colors. So I'm gonna go straight into white at this point while this is still wet. And I'm just gonna feather a little bit of that white in over top of it. Take my brush and take off some of the excess and then just pull it down into that color that I had previous. And that's is, um, it's essentially a, a technique called wet blending where you're just, while the paint is still wet, you are blending it into another color. The other method you can use for blending um, essentially just uses transparency over top of a dry base coat. Mm -hmm to um, define the shadows. But this is actually utilizing paint that is wet on both, um, on both ends of the spectrum. I see some people asking in, on uh, Twitch if the Legion paints are out in stores yet. Uh, they are, all of these guys here. That's the core paint set and Imperial and Rebel paint sets. Those are all available uh, at your local retailer. Uh, and then we just announced yesterday Republic and Separatist paint sets. Those will be coming early next year. Yeah, so I'm going to angle this guy down here so we can hopefully see this a little bit better in the camera. Um, so underneath here, I'm going to go pretty dark because I really want kind of like a, a very noticeable difference in the shadow in between the light and the dark. So this is almost like straight solid stone that's like underneath the arms down in these sections here. And I'm not going to go too far on the miniature. I'm just going to kind of do those two arm sections. I'm going to take my brush. I'm going to take off um, some of the excess paint. Dip it back into a little bit of the white here, and then I'm just going to kind of feather in the edges of it as I go. And the key part to this blending technique is like a lot of kind of like repetitive uh, motions to kind of just pull the paints together as you go. Just slowly yeah. kind of fuse those two colors together as well as you can. Try to get it on a surface where you can see a little bit better. Do you have any tips for if someone is kind of like maybe new to this technique and they're not sure where the shadows should be uh, if they're uh, painting this many? Yeah, I think what, what can certainly help is just to get like a pretty harsh, bright light. Mm -hmm. um, shine it over top of the miniature and take a picture with your cell phone. Sure. And then you just have like a reference thing of just like kind of like how the light would actually hit it. Right. Because when you actually sit down to go to paint, you want a little bit more flat, genuine light, so the shadow is not affecting how you're painting it as well. Right, right. So I think that you want to kind of go, go about it that way, where you can see like a good reference of dramatic lighting, mm -hmm. and then you can kind of go back in and, and pick it all out again. So I'm going to go down here to this kind of calf area, where this, this area would, would catch a little bit of light here on the top. So it's going to have a little bit of light up there at the very top of it, but then I'm going to go back in here with a little bit of the medium tone which is that Death Star Gray. I'm just gonna paint right in over top of that line of transition between the two of them. And then you just wanna have like a brush that is largely dry and you wanna kinda of just pull those colors together to kinda of get that blend that you're after. Hmm. And it will take some practice, like this is not the easiest technique uh, to learn for sure, but it's, um, once you kinda of get, get the basics down of just like how to load your brush properly and how to start to thin and uh, diffuse the paint, it becomes um, a lot more of a natural process and becomes a lot easier over time. Can you hold it a little bit higher? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Too high, sorry. Too high? How about right there? <laughs> right there. Right there. <laughs> We've got this little apparatus. We should probably use it, right? <laughs> Uh, a question uh, going back to shaking up the paints from from Kravik. He says, "I've seen some paints come with a tiny metal ball inside to aid in shaking. Do you suggest adding these, or do the FG paints come with metal shaking balls?" Uh, they do not come with them. They are handy. You just want to make sure to get stainless steel because otherwise they can rust mm -hmm. uh, over time and they can actually tint yeah, that'd be the bad. paint that you have. So um, yeah, you can you can buy them from some specialty paint manufacturers. Just try to get some stainless steel BBs of some sort. They're they're a handy little agitator to have in the bottom of your paints. Certainly not necessary. I think that if you um, are just kind of like aware of just shaking your paints periodically, it can work out just fine for you. So again, we're gonna kind of go back in here. We're gonna get this blend going on again by just filtering out this. Again, using some of that medium to just increase the, the transparency of the paint. And I'm working while it's still wet. So I'm just working on a very small area at a time. I'm just trying to get in there and get that fade going on. And this is something that I'll probably have to go back and revisit a couple times. Like you won't necessarily just nail it the first time. Mm -hmm. You have to be prepared to like, you know, spend a little bit of time to, to go back and kind of really leverage this technique because it is, um, it is kind of a time consuming bit. 
So we're going to go up here. Any, any of these areas up here where I know that it's going to catch a lot of light, I'm just going to go in and just add some of these highlights on the very raised areas up on the very tops. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We want this to be almost pure white at the raised parts. And you really want to try to focus on those edges too. Like if you can, if you can leave some of like the, the brightest white for um, some of the sharp edges, just to increase the contrast, especially when they're kind of like up against some darker uh, areas, kind of like this chest plate and some of these other spots, and it can help out quite a bit. I see some recommendations over in the Twitch chat. Uh, someone, uh, Disku7 says, I ordered stainless steel balls from Amazon, turned out not to be stainless. Uh, and some people say and use like glass balls or glass beads or something. Yeah, glass, would, glass could also work. Yeah, I'd be a little bit leery about, I mean, I guess if it's small enough and it's solid, it's not right. like really going to shatter in your paint. Oh, yeah. It should probably be fine. Yeah. I've not used that before, but that sounds like a good idea. I mean, glass is certainly something that's not going to mm -hmm. tarnish your paints at all. A uh, question from Drogon Forge: What size brushes do you prefer in most cases for Legion size models? For Legion size, um, so this is one that I often use. This is a one. Um, they're going to vary a little bit from get, from manufacturer to manufacturer, though. Um, I, I usually get by with like a two, a one, and like a double or triple zero. So the two I use for base coats. The one I use for layering and lights, and the triple zero I use for like teeny tiny stuff like eyes or. Um, fine detail like scratches or mm -hmm. anything like really subtle mm -hmm. that I want to try to get in there So yeah, th I mean I think you can get by with like those three size brushes I'll, You probably also want a dry brush of some sort, but the dry brush can be a cheap junk brush it, You just you're gonna tear those things up over time and uh, you just want something that you can use to dry brush um, your bases uh, you can also use dry brushing for fur and some other stuff hmm. depending on how um how you want the overall finish to look. A uh, question from Lyanks here. Uh, should you paint it disassembled to hit the more hidden areas or should you always put it together completely first? So I think um, I have a couple thoughts about that. So my one issue with painting things separate is that sometimes you'll invest a ton of time in painting something really finely and really nicely and you go to glue it back together again and you have a bit of a slip and you get too much super glue because you can't use mm. plastic glue once on a painted surface. Right. You have to use super glue. And right. super glue, if you have an excess of that stuff on the miniature, when it dries, it will craze and it will frost up. And sometimes it will also just produce like these really kind of chunky um, deposits yeah. on there. So that you really want to avoid that. So I think if you are careful with your gluing, uh, you can certainly take advantage of that sort of thing. Um, when we get to this Dooku miniature in particular, here, I can, I can just kind of show that to you really quick. Um, this fella right here is a dude that I'm working on, but he is still in two parts. Sure. And that is mostly so I can get in here and get the interior of his cape and paint a lot of that stuff. Right. And is then also I'll be kind of applying some uh, lightsaber effects to this guy too. So I want to make sure to like be able to get in here and get all the angles on his legs and all that sort of thing. So I think you're going to have some instances when um, a miniature can kind of come apart in a very clean way. Mm. Um, but it's I think you have to use a little bit of trial and error and just have to be really comfortable with your gluing yeah. steps and the precision in which you are gluing things together. Because like the more careful you are, probably the less glue you're going to use, the slighter the join. I don't know. It's kind of a compromise between durability and um, ease of painting as you're going through and doing it. So for sure, not, not, a, not a, you know, there's not an end all be all answer for it. I think, but mm -hmm. I don't like to paint things on the sprues. Mm -hmm. uh, some people suggest that just for easier holding, but mm -hmm. I find that the, the cleanup and all those steps that are involved in preparing a miniature for, paint are just uh they're just too demanding mm -hmm. um and you're just going to wind up scraping off way more paint than you really want if you're painting things separate like that so yeah. um, but yeah i can certainly see like doing things in sub assemblies and figuring out some crafty ways to actually attach them to some sort of handle or something mm. uh, sometimes people will just drill a small hole and use a paper clip and then glue that down to a base so they can hold the different parts like heads sure things sure. like that um you can get a little tiny jeweler saw called a uh or not saw but uh Jeweler's drill mm -hmm. called a pin vise, which is a little handheld guy. I don't think I have one handy here. Sure. Um, but yeah, if you just did a, a search for pin vise, P I N V I S E. Sure, sure. On the internet, so that you can uh, you can certainly find some some good examples of that. Perfect. Cool. All right, so I'm going to kind of continue on with this this general idea here of just like shading the sky, painting in the shadows, and we'll we'll, we'll try to get some more dramatic effects here. So we'll say like like the front of this. Um, 
this grieve that he has or will have like a little bit more shading and shadow down in here. And again, I've kind of mixed in a little bit of that medium with the dark gray. So you can kind of see here, you have kind of like a nice fade going on. Um, and that is like that Solus Stone color. Again, going to kind of start down here towards the bottom. And this is kind of showing you the other opposite end of, of blending where I have a dry surface. I'm applying a paint that is darker. And then I'm just going back in with uh, my brush with a little bit of water after I've taken all the excess off. I always keep like a, a paper towel or like a rag mm -hmm. uh, nearby just to take off excess paint. It's like a really handy thing to have. I'm not sure if you can see that in the in the shot with the palette, but it's this rag back here. Mm -hmm. um, it's junky. I've had it for years. But um, yeah, so you, you can just always just kind of take off the excess and then just have a dry brush to go back in and feather out your edges because you don't want to just introduce more paint when you're trying to make a transition in between layers. You want to just be able to kind of go in, paint your dark color, go back in here, take off the excess with a, so just have like a slightly damp brush. Some painters will actually even use like two brushes next to one another. I just don't like having to hold an extra thing in my hand. So sure. I just kind of work quickly and go back and forth between the two as I go. Cool. So this is kind of showing a little bit of that, that effect here where we're getting that kind of like dark, um, dark kind of shadow down here along the bottom where all this stuff would be quite a bit darker. You have to be careful because you don't want to go so far that this armor starts looking white. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of use these, these shadows sparingly. And you'll probably notice that like after a while you might be like, oh, I went a little bit too far with it. Mm -hmm. I need to kind of dial that back a little bit. Yeah. Um, in which case you can always go back in with a little bit more white as you, as you do it. I mean, yeah, that's definitely one of my favorite things about painting, even, you know, as a very novice painter, just like figuring this, like, oh, none of this is permanent. I can always just go back over. Oh, like, yeah, 100%. If I messed it up, I can, oh, yeah. I can fix that. I've gone and revisited Army several times. Mm. I think I've painted my uh, my Legion Stormtroopers for, uh, for my Imperial Army, like, three times. And they just keep getting more and more grungy and, and more kind of beat up. I like a lot of the stuff I've seen in The Mandalorian lately of, like, these kind of post Death Star Imperial forces and they yeah. look really cool when they're like nice and beat up. Yeah. So I kind of like that aesthetic. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, let's see, I see the Nick Brandt asking if this will be on YouTube later. It most certainly will. Uh, we will archive this on YouTube so you'll be able yeah, to watch it we, anytime. We, we've done a couple of these so far yeah. um, and we're kind of learning a little bit about it each time we do it. So uh, yeah, if you guys have any feedback about it or, or whatever, like make sure to let us know. Yeah. Uh, let's see, another question from Bly Inks. Uh, once a mini is assembled and you find you need to disassemble it, how do you recommend separating the glue without breaking the figure uh, for those with different poses or you want to change bases or whatever? Well, it largely depends on what kind of glue you got. Um, super glue will snap a lot more cleanly. So if you are planning on having some swappable bits on your guys, I kind of recommend using sparing glue, uh, super glue kind of sparingly on them because mm -hmm. um, you can usually just it will just get a little bit more brittle and just kind of pop off. Plastic glue usually creates such a significant bond um, by melting the two surfaces of the plastic together that it is much more difficult to remove parts. Mm. So I think that you want to be kind of selective in what um, what you use as far as uh, your, your adhesive to glue your minis, minis together. Now, sometimes you don't have much of a choice because um, the softer plastic guys, you have to use super glue on. Right. But that can work to your advantage when you're going back through and making some adjustments. Right. So basically, if you foresee that you might want to, like, swap the base out or change the pose, you should use super glue. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. 100%. Uh, so what colors are these that you're using? Uh, so uh, these guys here, I got three. Uh, I got Stormtrooper Armor, Death Star Gray, mm -hmm. and Solace Stone. Here, I'll put them up here in the camera so you can see them. These are the three right here. Solace Stone, Stormtrooper Armor, Death Star Gray. I think they're like a good, nice progression um, of, back real quick. yeah, yeah, sure, no problem, of uh, kind of like uh, a nice warm gray, which is kind of what I'm going for here. Mm -hmm. uh, when I say warm gray, it means it has like a little bit more yellow or red in it than it does blue. Um, a cooler gray would be kind of like the Fleet Trooper gray, I think, that has like a little bit more of a bluish kind of tint to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, th these guys are going more, a little bit more neutral on them. Uh, question from Dan Thaden. How do you manage to keep fine points on the brushes? The bristles on mine seem to feather out so often. 
Yeah, so uh, usually like the, the one thing you want to really make sure that you're keeping an eye on is you're not letting your paint go up past about like, the midpoint on your bristles. Because mm. as soon as paint gets down here in the ferrule, which is this uh, metal part here that holds the bristles in there, mm -hmm. it'll start to dry and then just separate those bristles out. And mm -hmm. that's what causes a lot of your real problems. I highly recommend you get some brush cleaner. You can get that from most uh, hobby supply stores or art supply stores usually comes in like a cake and like a little kind of tan tin. Um, and you want to just clean your brushes with that. And what's nice about that, that it has like a little bit of like a conditioner, kind of like hair conditioner in it, um, that will help you keep your points uh, quite a bit better. Um, I also have a bad habit, habit of um, licking my brushes as I go through and do it, <laughs> um, which kind of I find helps, but you. it's not good. Like, I don't recommend it. Don't do it. Uh, I've just got years and years of that bad habit. I've spent the last me. 20 years building up an immunity. To... <laughs> yeah, exactly. To solid stone paint. Yes. And now. A uh, question from ATX Minis. Are y'all going to Adepticon? Yeah. Yeah, I am going to Adepticon. I've, I've gone to Adepticon every year for like the last... 10 years. Yeah, there, and there's always people from FFG there uh, in an official sense. Uh, also asking if there'll be any FFG specific categories in the painting competition. Uh, we will have uh, a painting competition for Legion or a couple, I believe, or different, different categories, right? Uh, we'll have more information to share on that really shortly, uh, but it will be super exciting. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm stoked to see what people do uh, with Legion minis on kind of a competitive scale that should be really cool yeah yeah that'll be very very exciting lots of fun stuff that can be done with them for sure all right how are we doing on time i don't want to spend too much time on this general technique it I is 125 125 cool we'll probably just kind of continue around and do a little bit more of this mm -hmm. uh, kind of sporadically yes um so i'm just trying to like do some very fine edge highlights here to kind of pick out some of the surfaces of um, some of these parts, but I don't really want to overdo it because I don't want to like get away from my effect of this kind of light and dark mm -hmm. uh, zenithal technique. So I've kind of like done a, a, a stark highlight here on the top of this uh, thigh pad, but I want to mm -hmm. kind of smooth that out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take a little bit of um, white paint and again, it's a little bit of that medium to kind of thin it out a little bit. So it's a little bit more transparent. And then I'm going to start about here, mid of the thigh, and then I'm just going to pull up the paint up towards the top of it. And now again, I'm kind of going back, I'm taking my brush, and I'm just going to kind of feather out that bottom part to get that to fill in with the others. Mm -hmm. Hopefully try to get that kind of blend going on that I'm after. And I might need to go back in and mix a little bit of my medium tone and that white together just to paint some of the middle ground. So I'll paint some of that in there. Mm -hmm. Could you, uh, so what is it called, that product that you use to br clean the brushes to help keep them pointed? Oh, it's just brush cleaner. Brush it's usually, cleaner. yeah, if you just go to, like, uh, your local, like, uh, arts and crafts store, I'm sure they have, like, everyone I've been into carries the same stuff. And it comes in, like, a little brown tin. I don't remember the name of it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, yeah, it's just called brush soap. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also get... Um, a soap that does not have a degreaser in it and use that. Mm. Um, just make sure to not like get a lot of brush soaps that have degreasers in them because those will actually strip some of the oils out of your brush and uh, cause more harm than good. A uh, question from Adrian Poulanger. Uh, what are you using to keep the brush and paints wet? What is the setup on your side that you are clearing your brush with? Uh, that is a wet palette. So that is, um, it's a sponge that then has a piece of parchment paper that you use for baking, and that has kind of like a waxy surface to it, a right. slight waxy surface to it. Right. And then the sponge is just soaked with some water, and then I put the parchment paper on top, and then it pulls a little bit of moisture through that paper to keep the paints wet. Mm -hmm. It's um, If you just search for wet palette online, there's people that actually make very nice ones. Mm -hmm. This is one that I've had forever uh, that I bought from a gaming store, but you could certainly make one yourself too. There's not a whole lot of whole lot of tech to that it's just a, <laughs> essentially just a sponge and some parchment paper yeah some some manufacturers make like some really nice paper for for use in those mm -hmm. in particular but i find that parchment paper works just fine 
Okay, so I've got this kind of nice blend going on now here. That's kind of what I'm after. I could probably smooth it out with a little bit more time, but just for the sake of moving on, I just kind of wanted to show the general, the general procedure here. Mm. So the last little bit I'm going to do is I want to add a little bit of contrast to those marks that were kind of like on the um, some of the raised parts of the armor. So I'm going to add a little bit of this um, Mimban mud, which is a nice kind of mm. warm, dark, um, dark brown color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to thin it down with a little bit of water and a little bit of medium, because what I'm really trying to do is just to get like a little bit of discoloration mm -hmm. to go around some of those chip areas, like up in here, for example. A uh, question from Dan Thaden. What do you recommend for removing the paint? Um, there's a couple different uh, techniques that I've seen. I, I don't use, really strip paint from things that often because I usually find that it gets really um, gets really messy and really kind of gummy mm. uh, in a lot of cases. So I'm not really into that that much. Um, but there's actually, I think there's a, a couple products about that sp like specifically are all about paint stripping. Mm. I've heard from a number of people that... Um, Simple green, like soaking things in simple green can work. Mm. It just gets tough with, with plastic miniatures because they are just so susceptible to um, uh, like really harsh abrasive chemicals that they can kind of create some real problems. Right. And then Drogon Forge asks if there's a clear coat or sealant that you like to use. Yeah, uh, there's one called Dull Coat that I get from uh, my local hobby store. And that is, um, it does not have a lot of I wouldn't say it has like a ton of um, varnish or like real good protective qualities to it, um, but I do like it because it flattens out all the colors and creates like a nice matte finish to it mm -hmm. uh, when I'm done, which uh, which turns out great. So yeah, I think that there's you know there's a lot of options out there. Some people actually just like to use watered down um, brush on varnishes over top, which can look really good. Um, but it's yeah it's. I've used a lot of different ones and I haven't really had like a whole lot of problems in particular with any of them. But yeah, dull coat in particular I really like. Perfect. Okay, now I'm just adding like a slight little highlight on the bottom side of each one of these little marks, these little blaster marks, which kind of adds like the suggestion that they are kind of like more 3D, I suppose. And this is just with the straight white the stormtrooper armor mm -hmm. cool so i think at this point i would probably then just go back in and start to actually block in some of the dark areas mm -hmm. um so they have like a black undersuit right underneath them uh, let me see if i've got that sith, sith robe is actually a good color so that's a nice, real, real deep, deep, um, almost black. But I'm going to paint in with this color because I know I'll probably go in and shade it all after the fact. So they've got this kind of undersuit area in here that I'll just kind of carefully go back in and start to paint. And I do this before I'm like completely finished with um, all the highlights because uh, if I go outside the lines a little bit and I hit some areas that are not intended, uh, the touch up isn't so bad. I feel like I haven't like messed up like my final highlight areas in particular. So I would just go around and I would paint all this undersuit bit. You know, also paint. You know this uh, this binocular set here. I guess it's a monocular. I don't know. It's got one lens on it. What is like, it? I think they call it like macro binoculars or something. Macro like that. binoculars. Yeah. Yeah. The chat will know. The what chat Star will Wars binoculars know. are called. So yeah, just base coat these areas. Um, you can apply the same sort of zenithal shading by just like thinning down paints and going over top of it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as you go. Okay, are there any general questions about this technique? I'm kind of moving through them 
relatively quickly and we can certainly come back and revisit them in, in a later video if you guys want to learn some specifics about these. Yeah, I'm not seeing any specific questions about this technique right at the moment, so we could probably okay. move on just, to... Uh, just for the sake of some talking about stuff. some other stuff. Yeah. Cool. I am going to paint in his little visor bit. It kind of helps him look a little, a little more complete. Touch that up a little bit. Look at that guy. Look at that guy. All right, <laughs> cool. Uh, so the next bit I'm going to talk about, um, we kind of hit it on a little bit earlier, is um, painting your miniatures in parts. So with these battle droids, I'm kind of going through right now and working on some battle droids um, for my own army. This is kind of the start of one of them where I'm trying to work out my color scheme. It's based off of the AAT driver from the Kashyyyk sure. Yeah. Uh, found some images on the internet which I thought were super cool, so I thought that that was a pretty slick uh, color scheme. So I think I'm probably going to apply that to all my guys. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've done is I've uh, I've kind of set up like a whole bunch of them. So I've got like a full squad of eight guys all set up at one time, mm -hmm. and I'm going through and I'm doing what's essentially batch painting, which is just doing all the steps on one group of guys at one time. But the one thing that I have decided to do um, when I made these bases and. In one of our previous live streams, I went over the process of going through and making scenic bases with a two-part epoxy putty and just jamming some um, some rocks and other debris and stuff into those. So this is the same sort of situation, but let me see if I can find a good example. So this one here you can probably see in the camera. Um, so when I, um, I get my miniatures all assembled and then I put the putty down in the base and uh, I dip the miniature's feet in a little bit of water before the putty dries and after I put all these different elements on there and I push it down into the base so I have like these foot indents here. Mm. And then after that, I just kind of let it sit. It'll dry. And then when I'm going through in my process of painting, I will paint the bases first. Sure. So what I do is I pop these guys off of their base because then it gives me full access to this whole surface to paint and it makes it a lot faster and a lot easier for me to go through and do. So, for example, I, at this point, I'll just kind of go through how I would quickly paint these bases. I'm going to take a little bit of a kind of a, a bone-colored paint here, um, take off the excess here, and I'll just go through and dry brush all this very mm -hmm. lightly just to pick it all up. And this is after I've kind of like applied a nice base coat over top of it. And this is also handy if you want to like have like a dramatically darker or lighter color of base than the miniature that you have because then you don't have to worry about... You could prime this a different color. Mm -hmm. You know, you can just having them separate like that can can really help. I think um, mm -hmm. uh, when you're going through and actually just trying to get through and get a whole army finished. You know, yeah, because um, you just won't have to go back and rebase coat things and make a lot of adjustments as you go go through and do it. Yeah, it's timely that you're doing this because someone just asked if uh, if you like to use the dry brush technique. Yeah, dry brushing is awesome. I think that you want to use, like, a you really want to take off, and that's, again, why I'm using this rag over here. You really want to take off the excess paint, and you really uh, want to try to... Um, so as I go, I will kind of, like, turn this thing in my hands as, as I dry brush, and I kind of keep the same general motion as I'm doing it. Mm. And it's just very light. It's just kind of, like, whisking over the tops of all these areas. Yeah. But... Um, you know, I've gone, gone through and gotten that one done. Now I can just grab the next one, and I can just go through and I can do all of these brush, these bases all at one time without worrying about hitting the miniature at all. And in the meantime, like the miniature bit, I might be, um, you know, I have those on some temporary bases or something uh, in which I'm just going through and painting those parts. But I like to get these bases done first, and then I like to paint kind of like down towards the feet of the miniature and then just affix them on there. Mm -hmm. And I have all that stuff done for me already. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I'm going to go through and kind of show you again a little bit of um, kind of a little bit of wet blending. So just for me to get my rocks done relatively fast, mm -hmm. I will just put on kind of like a big sloppy coat of paint first over top of each of the rocks because I like to pick them out in contrasting colors, kind of like you see with this uh, this Dooku fella right here, mm -hmm. um, just so they stand out a little bit more. Um, so I'm just going to mix up a base coat for that. Um, for that, I'm going to do kind of like a cooler cooler blue, a little bit of R2D2, and a little bit of um, a gray. Let's do imperial uniform. That looks just fine. Uh, a comment from Adrian here. Uh, it says, it's interesting because I'm self-taught for painting, hence my lack of a wet palette, and it's great to see simple things like how you hold a brush and the level of control it gives you. Yeah, I think that, you know, we are in this golden age of the internet and accessibility to all this information, and you can really get a lot of insight from just watching people paint. I think I learned the most when it came to painting when I actually sat down and painted with people that were really good. Mm. 
and then I just picked up so much stuff um, just through osmosis almost, you know, mm -hmm. like you just, mm -hmm. just proximity. Uh, there was a question here, one moment. Ah, yes, Cool Joe Rules wants me to ask why your favorite color is puce. Why my favorite color is puce? That's the question. Because the puce is loose. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be avoided. Uh, I do like puce. It's a weird one. Most people don't know actually what color puce is. Yeah. Brought to fame by Monsters, Inc. Yeah. 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 It's kind of like a weird, dusty, rosy color, which doesn't sounds like it would be like some gnarly green, but yeah. that is not the case. All right, cool. So I, I mixed up this kind of bluish color here for the rock. I'm just painting it on there um, while it's still wet. Hi, John. Yep, yep. Sorry, I kind of get in the habit of going where it's comfortable, not where people can see things the best. And then I'm just going to go straight into this white. And I'm going to put a little bit of white up here on the top of this and a little bit over here. And you're like, oh, that doesn't look very good. But again, just kind of taking my brush, taking a little bit of the excess off, and then just pulling the paint into it just to get that blend to go. Hmm. And this is something that will just take a lot less time than just painstakingly going in there and layering in all these colors and all these highlights over top of things. And you can just move quickly around and just get all of your rocks done relatively fast. And you don't have to worry about the miniature getting in the way, which I find is like one of the one of the parts that often um, deters me from getting these steps done relatively quickly. Hmm. Yeah. Do you do you have any tips for someone who you know is maybe facing down like painting up their Clone Wars corset and all those battle droids? Like tips for avoiding burnout uh, over the course of painting, you know, a lot of similar minis. Yeah, I would I would highly suggest like getting some games in while you're doing it. So we're we're hmm. trying to introduce some more. Um, points values to play the game at. There's like a new 500 point format that some people are getting stoked about. Or even just like, you know, just get like a couple squads done and get them on the table and just like, you know, battle against another unit. And just like, you know, in 15 or 20 minutes or just roll some dice and just take a step back and remember that you are doing this for another reason rather than just painting them. You're doing them to enjoy a sweet game. Mm. So I think that that really helps me out. I will... um I will try to break up all my painting into uh, like set days of the week that mm. I'm just kind of like kind of set aside. Um, and I have a lot of them, but I only sit down and do it for a little bit each time. So I feel like just incrementally I will just get a little bit more done each time mm -hmm. instead of like going through like this like long haul slog of like five or six hours or something like that. Sure. I think that's a re that is a really good way to like get you... Um, kind of burned out pretty quickly is that if you just go through these marathon sessions. Yeah. The other thing I highly recommend is just get together and paint with other people. It's like so much more enjoyable mm. to just like sit down and shoot the breeze with your buddies and mm -hmm. like just talk about stuff and just set up a paint night like at your game store mm -hmm. or at somebody's house, you know, somebody brings some snacks, all that sort of thing. And it's, um, yeah, it's great. Like I, that's like one of my favorite things to do is just like sit down with friends and paint some dudes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some, they, have, they have some questions about the, the peg and cup sort of uh, Oh, yeah. This is, this like, is a what, new, what is that? <laughs> this is a new thing. This is uh, we, we watched a stream not too long ago, and we liked how they went, went about it. Yeah. And we're trying to get, like, you know, again, we're trying to refine our methods a little bit each time and get a little bit closer um, to, uh, like, real clarity on these techniques and so you can see stuff a little bit closer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we borrowed this from our good buddies over at Atomic Mass. Yeah, yeah, they did a, a cool stream not too long ago. I was like, hey, you know what, that's a good idea. And this is just, like, I think a mic stand, and then what I use on top of it is this is the cap from a spray Looks like, yeah. bottle of yeah. some sort. And then on top of that, there's a little bit of poster tack. So just this stuff that you used to put up posters on your wall, mm -hmm. and it can just affix to the bottom of the miniature, hold that fella in place, and it seems pretty handy because it can keep this thing in a consistent position and uh, we can kind of just move around and, um, and paint stuff as we go. So yeah, not too bad. So again, I'm just uh, going through, I'm just doing this kind of wet blending thing on the rocks, trying to get all these dudes done relatively fast as we're going through and doing it. So yeah, I think that there's certainly um, some value in painting your miniatures separate from their bases. Um, it can really help. Uh, just with the overall process of getting things done. And it's usually like the, the actual, um, it's the uh, it's the going back and forth and um, kind of separating things out, I think, that can just take up a ton of time. And just like breaking out more and more paints. And it's just if you have like everything and you just kind of approach it in this sort of like um, 
batch painting method, mm-hmm. uh, I think you'll burn through a lot of stuff a lot faster. So yeah, that kind of shows you kind of a quick and dirty blend on those rocks. I think this looks pretty cool. When you put the guy up on top of that, he'll look pretty slick. Look at that. And that's, uh, you know, I don't have to worry about, you know, dodging around and getting extra paint on his feet. So I can, at this point, before I glue that guy down to the base, I'll probably go through here and just kind of carefully paint in the feet or the areas that are going to be close to the base itself. Mm-hmm. And then just a little dab of glue on there and affix him on there. Nice. Cool. So uh, that's that's that little bit. I think um, any general questions about uh, painting things in parts or? Uh, oh, there's one question here from, yeah, from Bon Lee. Do you recommend using the dry brush technique on the miniature or just the base? So the dry brush technique will often produce some kind of grainy results. It's really mm. fast. It produces really dramatic effects. Mm. I think it's very cool. If you are thinking about using it, I might recommend that you put down a dry brush first and then an ink wash over top of that mm-hmm. because the ink wash will dull it back down a little bit and it will help smooth out the transitions a little bit. Mm-hmm. Also with your dry brush, don't jump too high up in color. Don't go from black to white. Like mm-hmm. you want you want some grays in there in the middle and don't be afraid to like do some dry brushing incrementally to try to get up from the lightest to the darkest. But right. yeah, just make sure that you use a really large soft bristled brush change your direction, really light pressure, and just just be patient with it. Like, it's a fast technique that will save you time, Mm -hmm. but if you rush it, it's gonna look pretty sloppy. Yeah. So, I I usually don't like try to dry brush um, anything other than like the bases, or if I'm trying to do like a really dusty effect on like the bottom of a cape or something like that, Mm -hmm. I'll I'll dry brush a little bit. But um, I usually, just because it's so unpredictable how the paint is gonna build up and the overall finish it's gonna apply, I I usually avoid that. So I I like to just kind of do it um, incrementally and just build up highlights and layers and stuff. I think that works out a little bit better. Yeah. Makes sense. Cool. All right, let's get to lightsabering. Yeah. I'm into that. Been wait- everything everyone's been waiting for. Waiting for lightsabering. All right, yeah. cool. <laughs> so uh, this is Dooku. Uh, I kind of mentioned before he's kind of a work in progress that I'm um, jamming on. And I have decided to kind of like separate him again, as I mentioned before. I kind of applied some uh, dark and nastiness to the bottom of his cape because I'm kind of doing this for a... Um, kind of a mud trooper themed army. I'm kind mm. of doing some conversions of some uh, uh, snow troopers to make them look like mud troopers because I really like how those dudes looked. Sure. And I like Mimban as a planet, so a lot of my guys are kind of grungy and, and gross looking. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, the idea here is that we've got a lightsaber, this red fella right here, which I've kind of added a little bit of a gradient to mm-hmm. um, from uh, light to dark. And it's going to radiate some red light. Um, onto mm-hmm. his uh, his tunic and, and other areas. So we mentioned before, dry brushing is actually a way you can get kind of lay the groundwork for this, this technique. Mm-hmm. Um, again, you have to be super light with it and apply it very, very uh, kind of sparingly. Yeah. But you can just use a dry brush in kind of like a light circular motion to kind of apply that. But you just wanna, you wanna use a very um, kind of like a darker red and just build it up incrementally. Sure. But again, I don't really like that technique that much. I kind of mm-hmm. like to use the medium and just apply layers over top of it to kind of get that, mm-hmm. that reddish pop. So um, I painted that lightsaber with, uh, which red was it? I think it was blaster bolt red. Mm-hmm. Um, and but I'm going to start off with my first coat with uh, Royal Guard Crimson, which is a little bit of a darker red mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. this particular lightsaber. And I'm going to apply a little bit of that to my palette here. Oops, I got to shake that up a little bit better. Yeah, that doesn't look too red. Nope. <laughs> it's a pink. All right, so this should be a little better. Cool. Okay, so uh, again, kind of going in there, grabbing a little bit of that, that medium that we had, maybe a little bit of water just to thin it down a little bit more. I'm going to grab a spot of my palette here that's not going to be contaminated by any other colors. And I'm going to mix in some of that into it, and that's going to just kind of um, increase the transparency a little bit without decreasing the viscosity of it. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of see, like, if I, as I pull that away, I'm not sure if you can get a shot on the palette or not, um, where it, it's kind of semi-transparent there. Mm-hmm. So we want to look here on where this lightsaber is going to be. So this is kind of where the majority of the light is coming from. So it's definitely going to hit his uh, this kind of cloak area down in here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to apply a little bit of that just as a guide mark for this fella right here, just to kind of see where that thing's going to go. And because I kind of kept this guy separate here, I'm going to just pop this off just so I can get better access to it. I'm going to take a little bit of that red. And again, it's a... Uh, you know, you're taking off the excess, and then you're just going to go through there, and you're going to kind of feather it as you go. Hmm. So that medium has just added a lot of transparency. 
added a lot of transparency to that paint. And it is kind of gradually going to be built up in intensity as we go. And I, I went through and I applied like the dirt and the grime and stuff first because I wanted that to also be tinted by this red because the, the light obviously is going to go over top of all the filth. How do you know how bright to make the red? Are you like looking at the movies? Or are you just kind of going with like what looks good? I think or... it depends on how far you want to take it. I, I like to kind of err on the side of a little bit more subtlety. So I don't like to go like super crazy with it. Right. If you really wanted to paint this guy like he was like in a dark tunnel or kind of like in that scene and um, at the end of Rogue One where, sure, where that's Vader like flips on his lightsaber and that's the only source of illumination. Yeah, I, yeah. I can see you going pretty far with it. But I, I'm just going to kind of go about that far on the cloak. You can see that very well, mm -hmm. kind of in that interior area there. And then I'll put it back on the miniature and kind of see how that looks next to everything else. A uh, question from Paul Copper here. Uh, what model would you like to see made just for the fun of painting it? Just for the fun of painting it, K2SO. Mm, nice. Yeah. yeah, robots, like that's my... He's a weird color too. He's like... He really is. Like I, I think you have a lot of fun like getting some kind of like cool modeled blues and... Mm -hmm. Um, kind of like warm tones and the armor. Like it, he doesn't just have to be like this black robot. He's got those crazy that, eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do in there. I think like some cool battle damage would be awesome. Nice. And I just like the character. I think K2S is like really, really cool. So yeah, I would yeah. love to. Uh, I'd love to see that dude. That would be awesome. All right, cool. So I've kind of got like that indication here. So that that color is also going to kind of carry up into his hand as well. And we want to kind of start to lay the groundwork for some of that too. So again, a lot of medium in here. This is kind of our first coat. We're trying to make like a decent transition into like the surrounding area. And we don't want to go too far into it. But that medium is really going to help kind of increase the transparency of what you got going on here. And just kind of build it up a little bit more gradually. It's almost kind of like a wash, but it's like the, uh, um, or a glaze, I suppose, would probably be the best term for it. Mm. And a glaze is essentially just like a layers of transparent pigment over top of things. Usually inks or um, shades produce the, the best glazing because they are a little bit more stainy, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Like they're, uh, they're inherently kind of transparent and then it's kind of like pouring coffee over top of something instead sure. of, I don't know, chocolate pudding. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of a weird comparison, but hopefully you understand what I'm talking about. Okay, so we're gonna go down here. We're gonna get a little bit of that, uh, a little bit of that red down in here as well. So probably like the most intense highlight is gonna be like right here along his cape, mm. and maybe kind of here in the front part of him. So I'm just gonna kind of brush some of that on, and you'll notice that I've cut, I've already gone through and like highlighted this guy, uh, and I might you know make some adjustments to the highlights uh, over time, but. Um, because we're really trying to use transparency to its best effect, I think that um, going through and actually, you know, kind of largely finishing the miniature first before you do this technique is going to work out the best for you. Mm. Okay, so now I kind of have like a general idea of where that's going to be. And again, I've, I've decided to kind of like take this, um, leave that top half of him separate so I can get in here and I can get a little bit of this a little bit more effectively. Get some of these reds in here. Do you do the sort of object source laying pretty commonly when you're painting? I don't overdo it. I think that, you know, I'm usually painting like armies. Mm -hmm. um, I used to do a lot of competition painting, but I just haven't really found the time to do that anymore. And I would kind of rather paint armies than single figures sure. in a lot of cases. So... Um, yeah, I haven't I haven't really done this too often, so this is kind of like a fun departure from from the norm. Yeah. I think that when I have like a a character with a lightsaber, um, I will more often than not do it because I feel like it's For kind sure. of like a fun iconic thing that I think kind of elevates the paint job a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, certainly not necessary, but I think it's kind of a nice little touch to do. I've seen some people do some fun stuff with um, blaster bolts on their. Uh, on their stormtroopers and things, where they mm. get like like a muzzle flash of like the the, the laser coming out, and yeah. then they kind of have like a glow going around it. Yeah, that, that stuff can, is that sweet. That can be very cool. So this is kind of showing like a little bit of the subtlety here, and I've just kind of gone through and just added in these highlights, just kind of gradually, um, and kind of built them up over time. 
And then, you know, as you get closer to the actual source, you just want to decrease the amount of medium you're using and increase the amount of red paint to just intensify those bits. But again, you like just kind of do it gradually as you go. You might find that it's just getting too intense. All right, starting to get the the idea there. So we've got a lot going on here. It would probably we've decided to like it's it's casting a little bit more glow than what I kind of originally intended. It's kind of extending a little bit further out, but I still think it looks pretty cool. So I think we're going to go down here and make sure to get a little bit of it down here on this boot as well. Thin this fella down a little bit. See a question from Kravik. Would you guys be open to a community challenge where we suggest you do alternate paint schemes and we vote on what you do? Uh, so not hmm. so much, if only because uh, we're somewhat restricted and, you know, like everything has to be uh, a pretty accurate portrayal of the Star Wars universe, right? So we couldn't do like, here's Dooku as a vampire or here's like purple clone troopers, you know, or that kind of thing. Yeah, we are a little, uh, bit, a little bit restricted in that regard. Yeah. I think, you know, if, if there was like a largely like a, a fan based thing in which absolutely we kind of, um, you know, had people showing off their own unique takes on stuff, as long as it doesn't infringe too much on other IPs. Right. I think that's always a soft spot. Like, yeah. You know, like Star Wars strives to make their stuff very recognizably Star Wars. And I think once you start mixing in other popular IPs into it to just do different variants and that sort of thing. It's uh yeah, that really restricts what we can actually show on our website. So it should be like, yeah. you know, you can, you can do some fun, creative stuff. Mm -hmm. um, we're not saying like you can't do purple stormtroopers. No, but please like, do. You know, don't, don't do. Oh, but we probably can't share that picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, knock yourself out. Have you seen the people who like have put the shields on their droidicas and stuff? Oh yeah, that's that, cool. That's so cool. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah we, we thought about that when we were sculpting those things too. We thought it would be kind of neat, but God, you didn't do it. <laughs> well, it was had to make some compromises and yeah. some, some different things that we wanted to, to try to achieve with that. As always. And it's like we didn't also just want to go down this road of like every effect being represented by a piece of plastic because mm. then it's just it kind of sets like some really strong expectations about what you're going to see. And For sure. Yeah, it gets a little a little restrictive. But but I'm glad to see some people doing that though. It looks fun. Yeah. All right, cool. So I'm going to... You know, I think I need a little bit more like atmospheric kind of transitioning here mm -hmm. on this red. So I'm going to kind of just thin down some more of those colors and kind of bring it further out. Get a little bit more up here on his chest too. Uh, a question from Legally Blind Gamer. Uh, have you considered doing a source book for the Star Wars tabletop RPG based on The Mandalorian? I'd love to have my players fight a Mudhorn. Uh, Ooh, well, yeah. you know, all of Star Wars is pretty much open to the Star Wars RPG. Uh, we haven't announced anything like that yet. But, uh, you know, stay tuned. And the system is, you know, robust enough that, like, if you want to get a Mudhorn on the table, you could probably uh, throw one together, throw the stats for one together and get cracking with it yeah i don't think it'd be that too tough to, to yeah achieve. i like to find like kind of a, a similar sort of uh like creature i guess in this case or vehicle or a character or whatever and use that as kind of like the baseline for my stats and then layer on some of some specific abilities that really speak to uh the theme of the character yeah yeah that makes total sense Question, will these paints be available regularly or are they a limited print run? I ask in case I get them and run out of paint and need more. Also, will they be sold as single paint pots? Uh, I, think, I think we're going to try them out as they are uh, as full sets right? Um, first and see how well that goes. Yep. And then we just have to kind of like gauge it and really see if it's something that we want to try to maintain. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we will still make like the basic paints available. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for sure. There are... Like in, in their sets, but yeah, I'm not right. exactly sure about the long-term plans for them. Yeah, the, the individual paint should should stay available. Um, uh, but then, yeah, no, no current plans to sell individual paint pots. Cool. So now uh, I've kind of laid down all of that um, World Guard Crimson that I really wanted to. So now I'm just going to go in with a little bit of Blaster Bolt Red and just add in some, like a little bit of brighter brighter points here just to kind of suggest like the really bright intense parts and I think like looking at these colors 
I think it will probably also benefit me to kind of tint this lightsaber a little bit more so it's a little bit more warm. Um, so I'm going to kind of achieve that in the same, the same way by just using this medium. It, you'll notice it's kind of a theme here where this is like super useful stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to kind of like tint that back down a little bit so it's a little bit more saturated and looks a little bit more in place with some of the other colors that I have going on here. This is essentially what's called glazing, where you're just you're just using a you know a transparent color to affect the colors underneath it to just kind of skew them in one direction or the other. Mm -hmm. And now I want a donut. I know. Doesn't sound good. Hmm. I haven't had lunch yet. I'm super. You haven't super had lunch hungry. yet? No, oh, geez. I'm crazy. <laughs> Can't stop painting. That's, that's not, not true. I had lots of meetings this morning. I wish I could just paint all day. Cool, that's looking pretty good. Yeah, that looks sweet. I like how that's going. Got some more work to do on them in general, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's. Uh, I think that's kind of like just general, general approach to it. It's uh, it's using kind of an existing color mm -hmm. and thin, very thin layers over top mm -hmm. uh, with medium, a lot of medium in there to like really help you smooth out those transitions. I think that stuff is pretty great. So yeah, matte medium, try it out. <laughs> You heard it here. You heard it here. Uh, you've heard it in lots of other videos and other places. Yeah. This is nothing new to miniatures. We won't painters. say you heard it here first. Definitely not. Definitely not. I can't take credit for that one. Cool. Well, awesome. Uh, that largely covers all the stuff that I wanted to discuss today. I guess we can yeah. fill some just general questions and see if anybody else has got some some other stuff that they would A, uh, like to learn here shortly, or B, like for us to cover in a future video. Yeah, if you have anything that you'd like to see here or in the next video, just shout that out in the chat real quick. Uh, and then we'll we'll certainly do more of these in the future. Yeah, uh, oh, oh things, man, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll sit down and paint anytime. Yeah, <laughs> well, you're pretty good at it, and you... Uh... Oh, thanks. It's a lot of fun for me. Is this what kind of what you're working on right now? Like this, this separatist, separatist kind of yeah, like yeah. These are all, yep. I'm, I'm double dipping here. I'm, I'm getting some work done, mm -hmm. and getting some work done on my own army too. This clone guy is kind of outside the norm. I'm not doing the clones just yet. Yeah, I like, I like the bad guys in the Star Wars universe. Yeah, yeah. The I, bad guys. The bad guys. The misunderstood. The misunderstood. Is what I like guys. to say. Yeah, yes. Exactly. Yeah, I love me some robots. Yeah, 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 for sure. They're very cool. Uh, Krapik says he loves to see uh, painting the larger vehicles like the AAT. Uh, yeah. So what's what's cool about these paints is they could totally work through an airbrush too. I mm. could I could bring in an airbrush and go over some basics. Oh, that'd be cool. That could get a little messy, but it's uh, it, yeah, it, it could, wouldn't be too hard. Put down brown paper can, or something. We have the technology. I think yeah. We could probably set it up. <laughs> brown paper technology. Airbrushing is certainly like a really good way to do it, but I can also show you some brush painting techniques to help you with those big flat surfaces. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's kind of like gradual layers, big brush. Mm -hmm. Just build it up over time. Like don't get too. As soon as you start slopping paint on there. That's when you really start to get a lot of brush strokes and peaks and valleys and stuff in your finish, and you want to try to avoid that. Yep. A lot of stuff you can do with spray paints too. Yeah. That can speed up the overall process. So yeah, I got a I got an ATST at home. I got to work on. So oh, I'll bring one of those guys. Well, there in. we go. Yep. Maybe uh, the perfect not like, perfect not, fodder. Not that everything needs to align with my personal collection, but it's nice <laughs> what it does. It, well, we could always buy you an AAT if uh, if you needed one to paint. So yeah, that sounds great. I'd be, I'd be down for that. Well, awesome. Uh, I guess that's probably about it for now, yeah. um, but thank you everyone so much for watching. Uh, we stream every Tuesday and Thursday, so make sure you subscribe to our channel uh, so you're notified whenever we post new stuff. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Links in the description. Thanks to Carolina Game Tables for this excellent it's table nice. that we've been painting on. Mm -hmm. uh, and check out previous painting videos uh, for beginner and inter intermediate painting tips. Those mm -hmm. will be showing up shortly. Uh, join us on Thursday. We're going to be playing some Genesis RPG. We're going to bring our RPG session to a close. So if you like RPG live plays, come back for that. We'll see you then. Cool. See ya.